So George Rowe joined the Department of Energy's Arctic Energy Office in September 2020 on loan from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. He served as a member of the UAF research faculty since 2013, affiliated with the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. His work there focused on development, adaptation, and integration of energy systems technologies, working in conjunction with industry, utilities, federal agencies, and communities. George's areas of recent emphasis include applications for integration of advanced nuclear reactors in Alaska's microgrid infrastructure and Arctic workforce, workforce development initiatives. George holds bachelor and master of science degrees in mechanical engineering from University of Washington. And we're very excited to welcome him today to tell us a little bit more about the Arctic Energy Office. So I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and I will turn it over to you, George. And George, it looks like you're on mute. I'm guessing you can hear me now. I can. And can you see my screen okay? Yes, looks great. Thank you. Okay, very good. Thanks very much for inviting us to participate in this meeting. We were very excited to, to be with you and even more excited about the opportunity we have to serve the people of the Arctic uh, in the, the work that we do. I'll talk a little bit about our mission, introduce you to some of our folks, and we'll provide some insights in terms of some of the things that, that we're actually working on right now. So the, the first thing, of course, is just to overview what our mission is, uh, which is it's a pretty broad cross cut in the sense that we, we focus, of course, on energy being from the, the US Department of Energy. But in addition, there's the science aspects and the, the security aspects. Security, I would, I would point out, includes not just political security, but aspects of security for the, the people that, and businesses that operate in the North. Uh, this, this involves energy security, but also involves food and water and, and many other types of, of security. And so it's a very interesting uh, op opportunity to bring together uh, many different facets of, of what effective life in the North uh, can be a healthy life. Uh, we are the nexus for the work uh, within the Department of Energy across the Arctic, uh, representing Department of Energy in this regard. And we are not so much a funding agency as we are a coordinating agency. So we provide consultation on topics, introductions. Uh, we, we help get folks get their word out in terms of uh, new meetings. For example, we just came from a a meeting where we were joining up Norway and Alaska in a maritime topic area, uh, maritime energy, waste management, uh, fishing, uh, et cetera. And, and then we, we try to advocate for issues and programs that others are doing. Uh, among those are the excellent work that IARPC is doing, uh, the future research agenda that so many people have contributed to is informing some of the recommendations that you hear about from part of our team. Uh, our contact data in terms of our website, our Twitter feed, et cetera, is at the bottom of this, the screen. And Liz, I'll, I'll make a PDF version of these slides available to you if you would like to, if others would like to have a copy of, of that in the future. So in the spirit of the people of the Arctic, uh, I'd like to introduce you to several several of those individuals now. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to start perhaps with our senior advisors. Uh, Matt Hevner uh, is with us from the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, Michael McElhaney is with us from the Office of uh, International Affairs within the Department of Energy. Carolyn Hinckley is with us uh, from the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy our organization, the office within DOE, uh, and I am on loan from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Matt and then Mike and Carolyn to just say a couple quick words about yourselves. Come on camera if you wouldn't know you're speaking, introduce yourselves, because you'll be making some comments later on. And I just like people to have a little bit of an understanding of, of who you are. Uh, Matt, would you take it away? Sure. First, uh, thank you to IARPUC for this uh, opportunity to talk with everybody and engage more broadly. And uh, thank you, George, uh, for leading everyone through this. And thanks, everyone on the phone for their time this morning and their attention. Um, by way of my background, I did my PhD in physics at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks in 2000. 
And um, then I've been here at Los Alamos and bounced around uh, back to Alaska. I was a professor of physics at the University of Alaska Southeast in Juneau uh, in the early 2000s. Um, both my kids were born up there. And so I've got a, a, a lot of uh, passion and interest and uh, love for the Arctic. So this, this opportunity to serve as a senior advisor to the Arctic Energy Office is, is really a fantastic uh, opportunity and challenge professionally and personally. So thanks again, everyone. And that's it for me. Uh, bef before we go to Mike, uh, there's a question in the chat about uh, cryosphere related things. And so this is one of Matt's areas of expertise. So Matt, if you would make sure that your uh, email address is posted in the chat, that would be great. Mike. Hey, thank you, George. Thank you, everybody. And thank you to IARPIC for organizing this. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Michael McElhinney. I'm the senior advisor. I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. I'm calling you today from traditional Cherokee lands in northern Alabama while I fellow work. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful, hot part of the country. Um, the, you know, it's a, at AEO, I'm primarily responsible for our international cooperation and our national security work and our maritime uh, cooperation with North Mission with Norway. So it's very exciting for me to see the Arctic Energy Office come up. A uh, long time, for a long time uh, uh, national security person for the U.S. government. Uh, prior to being at DOE, I was the uh, Arctic advisor to the Secretary of the Navy uh, at the Pentagon for a number of years. So uh, very excited to be part of the Arctic Energy Team and to see this uh, come about after years of effort uh, across the government. Thank you. Great. Carolyn, would you say hi, please? Good morning. I'm Carolyn Hinckley, and I am the Acting Communications Director for the office. I am actually calling from Alaska today, um, visiting with family up here. I have been with the Department of Energy for more than 20 years, and I am on loan from the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. And I'm very excited um, and appreciate the opportunity, Liz and IARPIC, to talk about our office and our stakeholders and our mission and love to work with uh, all of you on amplifying messages and helping you understand more about our office. Awesome, thank you very much. So I, I'm the I'm George Rowe, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm on, on loan from the University of Alaska. You heard my bio from Liz, so I won't say anything more about that. I did, would have wanted to let you know that uh, we are joined this summer and I think two, perhaps all three of our interns are uh, with us today. Uh, they are working in our Fairbanks office. And I am so excited to have this, just uh, this range of new thoughts, et cetera, that are, are coming into the work that we're doing. And wanted to just to acknowledge my thanks to, to Noah, Nicole, Josh, and Logan for, for joining us. So thank you. So the, the next thing I wanted to do is just do a couple little overviews of our the context. Most of you are very, very familiar with the Arctic, so I won't uh, drone on as if uh, this was brand new news, but I would like to draw attention to a couple, couple real realities. Uh, one is that just the, the challenges that we're seeing for population groups that are, ex, that are just being exacerbated by the effects of climate change and, and just the growing recognition of inequities uh, in this region and as well as beyond uh, between people groups. And part of what we want to do is be stewarding any kind of influence or technology or capabilities that we have that is able to uh, help address some of these challenges and help people to, to live uh, in the ways that they wish to live as effectively and uh, comfortably as possible. One of the big challenges in this regard, regard, of course, is the just the isolation of the Arctic from the rest of the continent. Uh, in in the case of Canada and Alaska and Greenland, uh, in other portions of the Arctic, uh, some of these ties are not as exacerbated, or other situations are in place that that allow communities to be interconnected. But when you have communities that are on their own. Uh, it is it is a it provides a very interesting uh, and difficult situation, but one that by working together we can address. And that that is part of what what we want to be doing is through webinars like this, making 
uh, ourselves available, trying to be aware of people uh, who are, are interested in, in conversations, working together in different ways, looking for introductions, et cetera. So I'd, I'd like to ask you to please use the chat feature to be introducing yourselves to us and let us know if there are topic areas that you would like to pursue with, with any of our team. So the reality is that we don't have a lot of time to deal with the changes in the Arctic. Uh, things are happening so fast uh, in the North, as, as many of you are quite aware, and the effects are quite catastrophic. On the other hand, there may be opportunities where we can actually help not just ourselves in terms of addressing our challenges, but others. Uh, the effects of climate change, of people, the effect of people uh, displacement by climate effects and other effect, other uh, situations, the realities of challenges when uh, spills or disasters of some sort occur and the need to respond to those uh, effects on our, our natural environment. Uh, for example, the forests that you see here that are, are, are just everywhere. And these are places where I think that the North and the mid latitudes uh, can work together. And this is part of what we want our office to be doing is helping to uh, articulate those opportunities, recognize them and, and to engage people so that when we're doing things, we're not coming up with one-off solutions that are applicable only in one particular location, but doing it in a mindful way of who else could benefit from this who else cares about these similar things? And make sure that we're, we're bringing researchers, technologists, communities, businesses together to, to work, work in concert instead of isolation. So that, that is a general, the general context for the Department of Energy when we think about the, the Arctic. There's such a wide range of stakeholders. Uh, we acknowledged uh, the indigenous people that, that have called the Arctic home for so many years. Uh, there are new, newer comers as well uh, in the private sector, industry, uh, other kinds of uh, governmental agencies. Uh, and all of us make up the new public that is in the North. And how do we work together with those various uh, interests, priorities, et cetera? The variability in terms of community size, the different resources that are available for harvesting and, re and uh, tying in are, are diverse, uh, which makes them challenging, but also gives us lots of options to tailor things locally. So I really do believe in this translatitudinal uh, circumpolar collaboration, and I'm, I'm eager for us to be pursuing uh, the priorities for the, the U.S. administration, our, our government in terms of looking uh, for uh, solutions that are just, that address climate change, that create jobs that, that help people work, make a family, family wage. So it's such a privilege to be here. The Department of Energy is involved in many different parts of the Arctic right now. And this is part of our job is to try to stay aware of the different efforts that are ongoing uh, throughout the department and many offices. I'm not gonna read all of these titles to you I'll leave it on the screen enough that you can remove them, but I, I will introduce you to some of the offices. So ARPA-E is the Advanced Research Project Agency for Energy. There are new ARPA entities that are evolving in the, the administration to help focus in on things that are very early stage, very difficult problems, but have, so they're high risk, but they have high payoff opportunities. The EERE is the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office within the DOE, the Office of Indian Energy, IE, and the Office of Electricity. Uh, these folks look at areas like microgrids, renewable energy capture, hydrogen, storage, uh, building built environment technologies, uh, just a wide cross cut uh, of the things, the energy solutions that come together uh, in different uh, integrated ways. The Office of Fossil Energy has actually evolved to become the Fossil Energy Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, and so they are working uh, not not so much in the area of new new ways of, of drawing out uh, 
power plants, et cetera, that are using fossil fuels, but how do we use fossil fuels more efficiently? How do we uh, draw, draw control volume around that uh, and address the carbon that's coming out, uh, looking at, at how to use that more efficiently, look at better uses for carbon than maybe as fuel, uh, looking at some of the rare earth and critical mineral aspects, et cetera. The Office of uh, International Affairs, IA, uh, works uh, with the Department of State uh, across the Arctic, uh, as well as uh, across the globe, looking at many of these different uh, synergies. LM stands for legacy management and NE stands for nuclear energy. These are related to the uh, legacy uh, effects of uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear energy use, in some cases weapons, in some cases uh, forward-looking uh, or not so distant past nuclear energy for power and heat. The SC is the Office of Science. This is the majority of the Department of Energy's investment in the North uh, through just a very comprehensive uh, list of, uh, you'll hear about some of the, the efforts uh, that we're, we're engaged in. Uh, very compelling work and very, very much tied into the IARPIC community uh, writ large. And many of the actual national labs, uh, the Argonne, Brookhaven, Idaho, Los Alamos, Lawrence Berkeley, Lawrence Livermore, uh, Na National Energy, that's the Fossil Energy, CM Lab, National Renewable Energy, Oak Ridge, Pacific Northwest, and Sandia National Lab are all have active programs in, in the North. And you'll hear about some of those uh, as uh, Matt actually talks with us uh, in just a moment. The efforts here that, that are ongoing uh, are represented here in, in this particular model. You can see uh, an example on the left uh, where there's an atmospheric radiation uh, effort uh, that's ground-based uh, tied into satellite data as well. Uh, the modeling in terms of basically water to, water to sky in terms of this integrated system uh, through the uh, E3SM endeavors. Uh, there's another program that you'll hear a little bit about uh, in just a moment. And then the, the Grid Modernization Lab Consortium focusing in on uh, whether it's the generation, the transmission, the distribution, cybersecurity, et cetera, just a wide range of examples the, of, of technologies that are being addressed there by labs working together. In fact, one of the examples uh, is in Cordova, which is what you see on the right there. We try to share examples of some of this work in our blog spot. Uh, so that's energy.gov slash Arctic. Uh, if there's articles that you would like to hear more about topics, please do let us know. Uh, we, we're trying to keep that refreshed on a two or three week basis. So there sh should always be something new and interesting to read there. So the, the things that we're working on right now are things like this, working, reaching out, coordinating with stakeholders uh, internationally as well as domestically, outside the DOE as well as within. Uh, we're developing roadmaps to try to, to guide research to, dr to bridge some of the gaps that we see in terms of knowledge or capabilities that, that, that seem compellingly important. We, we talked earlier about this energy justice, uh, poverty, it's energy poverty, et cetera, uh, really hugely important topic and difficult because so many of the um, challenges are interwoven and that the challenges can be quite dispersed, uh, different uh, with different locations and people groups. And so it's, it's something that we're trying to pay careful attention to and work with many across the Department of Energy who are addressing this very important area. The topic of technology transition is one that we think is particularly useful in Alaska and uh, other regions, parts of, of the, the Arctic, because the scale of many of the energy systems in the North are smaller than what you find in uh, like the contiguous United States. And yet the functions are all the same. And so there are opportunities at a much smaller scale in a very difficult environment to evolve out technologies that are relevant 
well beyond the region. So we're, we're excited about that opportunity for working in this, this space. In my introduction, was, there was mention given of the workforce development. So we're, we're quite interested in, of course, university students, for example, the interns that we have with us at both the undergraduate and graduate uh, level, but we're also looking at the, the lower grades, uh, recognizing that there are many, many critical areas, not just in the science, technology, engineering, math, which of course is important, but other disciplines as well, and, and trying to make sure that as an ecosystem, we're all involved as much as we can with the, with the evolution of the knowledge, the skills, bringing together traditional knowledge, as well as what some people refer to as Western knowledge, so that, that we can learn ways of, of seeing, ways of knowing, and work together in terms of understanding our world and how we should be uh, rightly living in it. A couple specific topic areas that, that I wanted to focus on, I mentioned that we just came from a call uh, with some marine top topics. Decarbonizing the maritime is hugely important across the globe and certainly important in the North. Uh, as the, the Northern waters open up, we'll see, we believe more and more port activity, including development of new ports. Of course, as uh, animals respond to changes in the ocean temperature and conditions, ice, et cetera, uh, there will be needs for the science, there'll be opportunities for looking at how can we most efficiently uh, interact with this important food source? Uh, what, what are the uh, responsible ways of accessing uh, materials that, that can be moved or uh, extracted and processed locally, et cetera. How, how can those, those be done in a, a low carbon kind of way? And then toward that end, we're trying very hard to be working with many other uh, offices. Through, we're actually just going to establish a working group focused on the Arctic within the Department of Energy to make sure there is regular uh, dialogue ongoing. And we'll be uh, consulting with external advisors uh, in this topic area. So I'd like to, to turn the, the talking stick, if you will, over to Matt Hebner. To, Matt, would you tell us a little bit about some of the topic areas that you're involved in here? Sure thing. Thanks, thanks again, everyone, for your time this morning. And thank you, George, uh, for the opportunity um, and the, the great uh, overview of the office already. Um, before I dive into a couple of Office of Science examples, um, maybe let me uh, frame this or uh, emphasize some things that George has already said. You know, really, our office is serving a coordinating role, and a lot of what George has already done this morning is is help people living and working in the Arctic understand and connect with DOE. That's fundamentally what AEO is about. Um, but we recognize that that's it's, it's definitely not a one way street. Um, we really are helping DOE understand the people that are living and working in the Arctic and uh, the challenges and opportunities that are, are, are present in the Arctic. And I think our, IARPIC is a perfect uh, forum for us to, to engage with the people that are living and working in the Arctic. Um, and just going, looking at, you know, listening to George talk about the department is, is always fantastic. Um, I'm personally often surprised by the breadth of everything that's going on at DOE. And so we appreciate that that can be a real challenge. Um, and as George mentioned, um, one of our roles is really to help with the connectivity across DOE and where the department is spending significant um, effort is the Office of Science. And that's probably the part of DOE that most people on the, on the phone or, uh, or on this call are, are most familiar with. And so I've got a couple of examples that I'll talk about how AEO is working with some Office of Science programs. And so I think People on the call are, are probably very familiar with the NG, the Next Generation Ecosystem Experiment Arctic that's going on um, primarily in the Seward uh, Peninsula right now. But uh, this is a Department of Energy Science, uh, Department of Energy Office of Science program um, that started in about 2012. And uh, it's uh, a great partnership with several of the labs and uh, the, the program manager at headquarters is Dan, Daniel Stover. Um, Stan Wolschleger at Oak Ridge is, is the, the, the lead and the PI for this. Um, and our office is not taking over this work or uh, you know, trying to direct anything that the Office of Science is already doing. What we're doing is really bring this basic science capability um, to the DOE applied offices. So George talked a little bit about 
you know, when he went through a number of the offices, there's Office of Electricity um, and some of the more applied offices, but then there's Office of Science that really invests in, in basic capability. And there's this common framework for research, thinking about very low TRL, technology readiness level work that goes on and then getting that applied or deployed, um, which is really an emphasis for this administration. And of course, we don't wanna do work that doesn't end up being used. And so our office is helping make that connection. Um, and obviously I think there's good coordination um, already with NG and across the research community. I think NG Arctic is already well, well engaged here with IARPIC. But part of what we're able to do is, is bring that and find how it fits in the broader DOE. Um, so that's just one example with the NG Arctic that I think a lot of people are, are, uh, are familiar with um, where we're doing a coordinating role. Um, on the next slide, on slide 11, <clears throat> is another example of a, a little bit more uh, tactical work that our office is able to do, but I think that's really important to the broad research community as well as, as the Department of Energy. This is around the Electoc Point airspace. Uh, George mentioned the ARM, or the Atmospheric Radiation Monitoring Program. That's been a long-term uh, Department of Energy Office of Science program. And there's permanent locations such as the one in Ukiagvik, um, but then there's also relocatable scientific systems which have been deployed for almost the last 10 years uh, at various places, but the, the one that's been deployed at Aliktok Point um, is being removed. At, currently it's being uh, relocated and uh, as part of the regular rotation that Office of Science does. But as part of that deployment for the last 10 years or so, um, Department of Energy has operated airspace right off of Electoc Point. There's uh, two specific ones. I won't get into the specific details that are shown on the chart, but uh, this is key airspace that the department um, coordinates and the Office of Science as they're pulling, pulling the arm facility out of that um, is, is leaving nothing behind, but this, uh, the work that went into getting this airspace with the FAA and maintaining it uh, is, is hugely valuable to the research community and also a, a bureaucratic nightmare to try to reinvent. And so our office is, is taking over the responsibility for this airspace. And we've worked not just with the Office of Science to make sure that this is a, a good idea from their perspective, but also more broadly across the department um, and also with interagency partners and university partners. And so we talked with NOAA, NASA, and NSF and looked at the potential for um, UAV flights, um, tethered balloon experiments, balloon launches, um, atmos basic atmospheric research that could be pursued with this uh, airspace going forward. And we found broad departmental, interagency, and university and other stakeholder support for maintaining this. So this is an example of um, where we can coordinate across the department and externally to uh, keep research and uh, facilities available to the broader community. I think the next slide is my last slide. I'm just gonna briefly talk about this uh, Arctic Labs partnership, which is um, an Arctic Energy Office led um, effort that's primarily engaging the national labs at the moment. Um, it's coordinated via the Chief Research Officers Council uh, there's a representative from each of the 17 national labs. That's basically uh, like the vice chancellor for research at a university, uh, sort of a deputy director uh, of the lab position. 11 of the labs are participating in the University of Alaska uh, because our office is located on the campus there and because there's such a, a strong and important voice for the Arctic um, is coming together. And this, this really grew out of the 2018 national lab days that occurred in Fairbanks. Um, hopefully many people on the call were able to join some of that. Um, last summer, the ALPS group had a virtual workshop looking at broad Arctic research needs. And um, this is a departmental focused look, but we're very cognizant of the work that's going on through IARPIC and the five-year research plan. So we're, we're, we're looking at what DOE needs are and capabilities are, but how that fits in with the broader capabilities across the research community. Um, currently, we're collaboratively sorry, collaboratively developing a research roadmap that's going to inform the DOE, Department of Energy's Arctic strategy. Um, and that's done in close coordination with both the Office of Science at the department and their uh, folks that are engaged with the IARPIC road mapping and, and planning efforts. Um, Gary Gerenhart uh, is, is helping us branch both the IARPIC and the DOE work that we're doing at AEO. 
um, as well as other folks that are that are involved in, in the IARPIC road mapping. And I just list, I won't go through the acronyms the way George did, but there's a, these are the 11 labs that are involved in the ALPS uh, project. Um, and I think that's my final slide, George. Thank you very much, Matt. We'd, we'd like to uh, turn our attention now to some of the work that uh, Mike McElhaney is coordinating with. And so, Mike, let me advance to the next slide. And would you like to make some comments? Sure. Thank you, George. And uh, thank you, Matt. Um, you know, in international affairs, um, there is a challenge of a lot of work is either uh, close hold or old news. So this, this slide may not be as informative as that. So we have a lot in the way um, that maybe we're not quite ready to share. But, you know, AEO covers both the domestic Arctic and the international Arctic. Um, and so we are responsible for DOE collaboration with the other seven Arctic states when it comes to, it, when it comes to uh, DOE interactions with them, both representing DOE and serving as a single point of entry into DOE for those countries on their specifically Arctic issues. Um, we represent DOE and a lot of US government fora, of course, um, uh, many of which you, you guys are familiar with, the Arctic Policy Group, the National Security Council, a num number of other organizations uh, and collaborations. We are, we are the specific uh, ones. So we, we get to attend lots of meetings with both cross paths with many of you. Um, and then in our work with the Arctic Council, uh, of course, the State Department representing the United States at the Arctic Council, um, but we are the sponsor for the ARENA program through the, uh, through the SDWG. And we uh, finance bringing uh, community energy leaders from across the Arctic uh, together in a cohort. They're currently working with the FY19 uh, cohort. We've not been able to meet yet because of the coronavirus, but hopefully next year in person. Um, and if, in conjunction with Iceland and Canada, we will, uh, we'll also hold on-site uh, collaborations. Uh, we will sponsor a basically a community energy boot camp and program management uh, mini camp at UAF in 2022 uh, for people across the Arctic to learn more about not just not just uh, renewable energy, but how to get a project built and deployed and learning from each other best practices and uh, how to go back to their uh, community and their countries and be a community energy week. It's a really fantastic program. I could talk about it all day. I put their logo up there. Uh, but a really great program that was sponsored uh, on behalf of the Arctic Council, our primary contribution uh, currently to the Arctic Council. Um, then uh, next slide, George, please. Or somebody. <laughs> I don't think I have control of the screen. Ah. Um, but we also have uh, a bilateral and multilateral cooperation underway, uh, not through the Arctic Council. Um, the Department of Energy uh, just this year has signed memorandums of understanding, memoranda of understanding uh, with Canada and with Denmark to, en to enable Arctic cooperation. Um, we're very excited about those. We see the, we see the possibility of extending uh, AEO cooperation with uh, similar organizations in Canada and Greenland and uh, within the Kingdom of Denmark um, to facilitate kind of the deployment of uh, transarctic, transarctic renewable energy and maritime uh, maritime innovation, uh, maritime energy transition efforts. Uh, so we will be launching projects with them in the near future. We're currently discussing some of how to implement these those MOUs, and we are very actively engaged in the maritime uh, energy transition. Um, you know, the Arctic being a, a maritime domain defined by its, its central basin. Um, we, we think this is vitally important, both for meeting the president's uh, climate change goals, but also to ensure the continued environmental and economic sustainability of uh, maritime activity in, in the Arctic, which of course is, is highly dependent, highly, uh, highly critical for the peoples of the Arctic. So um, on the multilateral side, uh, we are participating in Mission Innovation, which is conducted through the International Energy Association. Uh, Mission Innovation is a multilateral challenge, and we are participating in the maritime energy uh, portion of that, looking at how to decarbonize uh, 
uh, maritime transportation, both on the shore side and on the sea side, to meet climate goals and to end, <laughs> potentially end the hydrocarbon dependence in the maritime, uh, maritime fuel chain, or maritime energy chain, I should say. We're working very closely on very much in that. The kickoff was in June. Um, there will be some initiatives announced very soon. And it's just a tremendous, tremendous program. Uh, we're also engaged in some bilateral ener maritime energy transition efforts. Uh, we just met with one of our Arctic partners today. I won't use their name because I, we didn't ask them if we could use their name, but I recall. Um, and we're working very closely um, uh, with another one on, again, finding specific examples where we can where we can bring uh, bring uh, international maritime technology, which is in many cases are more advanced than what is currently deployed in the United States, um, to the American Arctic uh, to enable that to, to move forward. Um, and then on the, the unilateral front, I couldn't put a bullet in here, we are working directly in the state of Alaska with, uh, with ANCs and with municipalities and the federal government on uh, bringing about port modernization, you know, there's much discussion about whether and how there will be new Arctic ports, and the best time to make them energy resilient is before they're built or before they're modernized. We're working very closely on some potential port modernization efforts um, in Alaska, uh, currently, again, utilizing best practices, both from our international partners and then from the goals um, of the maritime energy transition more broadly across the, uh, across the United States. So, uh, you know, it's a very, that is literally the tip of the iceberg on what we're doing, pardon the pun, um, but we are, we are very, very, very active in the maritime domain and expect that to be one of the key areas of the Arctic Energy Office going forward. Uh, and our partners, I, our, all of our Arctic partners are very much interested in the maritime energy domain um, in various forms. And we expect that to be a, one of our principal areas of cooperation. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. And uh, I wanted to see if uh, Carolyn would would you like to talk about some of the work you're doing in terms of helping as our communications director get the word out? Sure. Thanks, George. I am working on building out our website, and as George mentioned earlier, we have a number of great blogs that are already posted, and I'm working on posting more. Um, during my detail assignment, we had one that we just posted about our great interns, Josh, Logan, and Nicole, and um, Nicole will be posting one soon um, about um, a paper that she wrote, and we're adapting that into a, a blog. And so I encourage you to go to energy.gov slash Arctic and be familiar with the blogs that we've already posted. And I'm also working on a resources page that will be a hub for things like jobs and fellowships within the department and links to the national labs and user facilities and webinars. And so I encourage you to check back on our website soon for that resources page because we want to be the hub and the resource for all of you, our stakeholders, as we continue to work with you and connect with you. And I also encourage you to Follow us on Twitter um, at Arctic Energy DOE. And it's been on the bottom of Georgia's slides. Um, you know, we would love to connect with you and amplify your messages and just help get the word about out about all the great work that's going on within our office, in the department, and with the Arctic in general. Thanks, George. Back to you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, and as an example of one of the things that's ongoing, uh, we had a, an opportunity actually to be in Juneau for the, they, they had like a road rally of electric vehicles uh, and Matt actually drove a leaf uh, from a friend there uh, in this parade of, of electric vehicles. The bus that you see there is an all electric bus. It's the first one in Alaska as I, as I understand it, uh, but not the last. Uh, later on, not in this slide, uh, he actually got into an electric, all electric school bus in the community of Toke, which is further north, uh, a much uh, colder, more challenging environment. This is one of the topic areas that as we're looking to clean, uh, 
go toward a lower emissions economy, uh, trying to figure out how do we move people and things in a, the lowest emissions way. In some cases, uh, it may be a hybrid electric system versus a all electric system, but there are ways of reducing the carbon in any kind of transport. And we believe we, in our lifetime, we will see this in aviation as well as in the ground and the evolving maritime. So it's really exciting to have a chance to be interacting with all these topic areas. One of the areas that's evolving, and I recognize a couple names from this community actually in the list of participants, uh, is it, are there opportunities for moving uh, some of, or using some of the evolving microreactor or even small modular reactor uh, energy systems at, as sources of heat as well as power in the north. There have been several active studies ongoing. If you're interested in uh, seeing the artifacts that came out in any of these, uh, post a, a question in the chat and we'll provide you links separately. Uh, but the idea of what are the issues, what, what are the that need to be addressed and thought of carefully by citizens of the North as they consider whether to embrace, embrace this kind of technology, how, how should that inform the work by developers, by the national laboratories, by the Office of Nuclear Energy as they evolve out capabilities. Um, it, it's just a really interesting space. We, we believe that we'll see it applied, uh, the potential applications cross sectors, perhaps beginning at defense sites where there are uh, already existing combined heat and power distribution networks and established security communications, et cetera, and then moving into large municipalities, remote industry, and perhaps uh, larger communities uh, across, across the North. So be very interesting to watch how this evolves. There's actually a panel proposed to, to discuss some of this at the upcoming Arctic Circle Assembly in October in Reykjavik, whether it's in person or virtual, uh, that panel uh, will, is scheduled to be part of that effort. So where do we go from here? So the, I mentioned earlier on that the, one of the challenges we're facing is people being displaced. We're also seeing new start challenges like the new port that Mike mentioned, places where uh, folks will be moving or, or new industries will be evolving as, as resources become applicable. The, it's a challenging place to work. The, the, the threats, the, 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 just the operating context that's difficult naturally, but as well as human caused challenges, whether deliberate or accidental. Everyone has aspirations of one form or another. How do we, how do we address those in a collaborative, fair kind of way and there's, there's some difficult realities uh, and some promising realities that we need to be thinking through uh, as we uh, move, in, move into this, this new future of ours. The, whoops, there we go. The, how do we address that? I, I think that the, the, there's a variety of pathways. They start with learning. They start with using the assets that we already have in place. You know, what, what do we have in hand? Focusing on that, how, does it, how do we use those to address the aspirations, the priorities of local communities and, and other entities? How do we acknowledge similarities and differences and, and recognize how to bring those together in a collaborative way? The three big areas for, that I believe are Priorities are these, these climate challenges that, that are facing so many communities across the world. The topic of uh, equity and justice in energy and all the things that come from energy, uh, not just energy in and of itself, but energy to, to help life happen, at work happen, et cetera. And how can we take the technology that is involving and shape it and deploy it uh, in the North. And so th those are the topic areas that we're pursuing as, as we're looking, looking to the future, working in the now. The, there, there are just so many different opportunities that, that we are trying to acknowledge and, and kind of triage, I guess you might say. 
so much great work doing being done by others and we want to make sure that that we're not no one is reinventing the wheel everyone is building on one another's work and we're excited to be part of that larger community alaska's motto is north to the future and i believe that with all my heart i th i think that the things that that are happening and can happen in the arctic are relevant so far beyond to the future not just of the north but of the world and i am glad and and grateful that we can be part of that my contact date is there uh the, the team's contact date is in the chat uh, I'll, I'll pause here so we can do any quick questions in the time that we have remaining liz and i'll stop sharing my screen so i can look at the chat if that's okay perfect thank you so much george and matt and mike and carolyn for a really excellent overview of the new arctic energy office um, so for folks who have questions, first of all, um, any of the resources and links shared in the chat, I am going to add to the event page. So um, if you lose them, you can find them later. You can also download the chat uh, in the chat window by clicking the three little dots in the lower right corner. Um, but yeah, if you've got questions, you can add them to the chat, or if you'd prefer to ask them verbally, you can raise your hand uh, using the reactions button at the bottom of your screen, or if you're on the phone, star nine. Uh, and I saw we had one question um, a little ways up in the chat um, from Doug Howard asking if the office was virtual or a physical location. The answer to your question, Doug, is yes. So we have a physical office at the University of Alaska Fairbanks campus. Uh, you might recall that there was a green arrow on the slide that I showed at the, the second slide in the deck. Uh, so we're in the engineering learning in innovation facility there on campus. Uh, that's where the interns are based uh, this summer. Uh, Matt, Mike, and I are coming from different organizations as we're kind of bringing together this office. And so we're up there uh, pretty much every week, one or more of us is going to be in office in Fairbanks. But we're also doing uh, the Department of Energy is on a maximum telework uh, posture because of just virus management kind of challenges. And so we're doing a lot of our work virtual. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks, George. I appreciate that. So one other follow on maybe. Um, I see that some are interim. Um, how long do you think uh, it'll be before there are established um, leaders in place? Um, not that could take your place, but to um, uh, lead the um, office. It's a great question, Doug, and I wish I could give you a hard answer. Uh, that is, as you mentioned, we are an interim group. Uh, our job is to, to establish the office, which will include permanent staffing as well as these mission related things that, that we've been talking about. Uh, through, we believe, we, we have position descriptions, we're ready to roll in terms of advertising for positions, but there are a couple uh, constraints on us in terms of being able to post those quite yet. So I, I think that we'll see those that being freed up before the new or by the new calendar year, but it, it's a little bit tied up with the FY22 uh, budget release. And so that's, that's pacing when we'll be able to bring in the, the permanent people. So sorry for not a more precise answer on that. No, that, I, I completely understand. And uh, I really applaud this uh, office standing up. Um, us at uh, Corel uh, in Erdic. Uh, look forward to uh, further discussions with you guys. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Doug. We've got a question in the chat from Helen Wiggins at Arcus. Uh, can you say a little more about the activity Matt mentioned with the research roadmap to inform DOE Arctic strategy? For example, will that be a public report? And how would it impact future DOE Arctic funding and priorities? Mm, great question. Matt, you want to feel that one? Sure, yeah, no, that is a great question. And uh, the intent is that it's really an internal planning document to inform DOE programs and investments going forward. Um, the hope is that we'll have an executive summary or a public summary that we can release that describes the priorities we've developed. But when we talk about specific plans for future programs, that'll be that'll be probably a, an internal document. 
Thanks, Matt. I guess one thing that I would say add to that is that uh, we will try to identify you know the gaps that are being observed, challenges, et cetera, and profile things like that as as we're allowed to, without providing any inappropriate information about impending efforts, et cetera. So, thanks. And a question from Hayo Eichen. Uh, what type of specific opportunities do you see to advance workforce development, for example, green economy, energy transition that's relevant to Alaska and other Arctic nations? Uh, let's see, Mike, are you still with us? I know you had to drop off. Do you see him on the list yet, Liz? He is, but his camera is off, so he may have had to hop off. Step away. Okay, I'll, I'll address that then. Uh, it's a great question, Hayo. And I, I think that what we're, we're kind of finding our way forward here, the challenges that are being addressed by programs like ARENA are to, to build local capability. So, so the ability that brings in energy literacy, project management capabilities, awareness of, of what is available, uh, looking at things that are not just energy specific, but looking at things like water and waste and e-commerce and heart, you know, de deployable manufacturing. So place-based manufacturing, uh, looking at electrification of maritime. Uh, how, do, how does that happen with, uh, what does that mean in terms of recapitalizing the fleets of, of fishing vessels and other kinds of service vessels? So I, I believe that we'll, we need to be recognizing that this is a, a fairly long time constant kind of a situation, uh, addressing what we can in terms of near-term opportunities through programs like ARENA or internships, sponsoring research fellows, et cetera, all of which uh, we are and will continue to do, but also looking at that, the lower, lower, younger levels of uh, future citizens and working with them to make sure that they have opportunities to make uh, informed decisions about how they want to engage uh, in terms of occupations of the future. And if you have specific ideas on, on any of these, you know I value your, your insights and I would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, perhaps we don't have time today, but I would love to hear more. Thanks, George. Thanks, George. Thanks, Hayo. A uh, question from Sarah Bowden here at IARPIC, uh, wondering whether you'll be partnering and coordinating with the Arctic Domain Awareness Center. Yeah, so we're actively interacting with uh, the church and the other folks at ADAC. Uh, of, as others have said, we're not going to try to redo or replace any of the work that's ongoing. But this is a very important coordination space uh, for Department of Homeland Security, the, the U.S. Uh, Coast Guard, and then all the other agencies that are actually interacting with them. And as we see the more and more maritime activity happening, services like those provided by ADAC are critically important. And so we, we value the interaction we've had to date and we intend to continue it. I think we have time for maybe one more question. If anyone wants to raise their hand, come off mute or drop it in the chat. And if not, George, is there anything you'd like to say to close us out? Just thank you. This has been a, a really wonderful opportunity to share and hear for some of these great questions. I'm gonna take advantage of that triple dot thing to download the chat so I have contact data, et cetera. And we, we just look forward to ongoing dialogues. Things like this are just like dropping a rock in a pond. It's, it's what you're doing is starting ripples. And so how do we follow up on those things and interact with each other beyond this one, one particular time? So thank you for the time you've taken with us. Thank you so much, George. And thank you again, Matt and Mike and Carolyn. Um, and thank you all of, all of you for joining us today. Uh, so I will be posting the recording and uh, info from the chat on the event page and on our YouTube. So if you had to step away or if you want to share it with a coworker, you can send them the link. Uh, and until you know, hope to see you at a future IRPIC event. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.